There we go. Awesome. So welcome everyone to Space Week uh, and Exploring by the Sea of Your Pants. My name is Lucia and I'm going to be your host for here. Uh, so all week long we're having Google Hangouts with astronauts and engineers and astrophysicists and roboticists and scientists and just so many other people who just love space exploration. Uh, so thanks for joining us. And remember, any photos that you take during our Hangout, you can actually share them online with us on Twitter or on Facebook using hashtag explore space. And then you can also tag us, our own Twitter account in there too. Uh, and then at the end of the week, we'll be choosing some classes who are going to win some pretty cool prizes. So that's exciting. So remember, use hashtag explore space. Uh, and like I said, we have five classes joining us from across North America. We have a class from Henrico, Frederick, uh, Glenview, North Vancouver, and Oakville. So we're all kind of spread out across the continent. Uh, and as you can see, we have our guests with us. We have Dr. Rigby, who is an astrophysicist who works at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. So she has a PhD in uh, from the University of Arizona and currently is studying the data from the Hubble Space Telescope to see how galaxies have evolved over time. Now, next up is going to be studying all that awesome data we're going to get from the James Webb Space Telescope, but she can tell us all about that. So I'm going to pass it off to you, Dr. Rigby. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? I think so. I'm seeing nods. Okay, cool. Hi, howdy. Um, <laughs> my name is Jane, and I work at, yeah, good. Um, I work at NASA. Uh, and um, and the Goddard at the Goddard Space Center, which is right near Washington D.C., or like the last stop on the metro. Um, and so I think the way this is going to work is that I have tons of questions for y'all, and so I hope you have questions for me. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about like what we do here and what the what kind of stuff we study. But I want you to like your homework assignment right now is to pick up some good questions because. I already know what I'm going to say, but I don't know what you're going to say. So for me, that's way more fun. Um, OK, a little bit of background. So I'm an astronomer. Um, that means that I like to look at galaxies, and I use big telescopes around the world. Um, I like to, um, so I use telescopes that are on mountaintops, uh, on the, you know, the biggest mountain on Hawaii, the Mauna Kea. Um, mountain, and I use uh, telescopes in Chile, um, down in the in the Andes Mountains in Chile, and I also like to use telescopes in space. Uh, I use the Hubble Space Telescope. Okay, who has heard of the Hubble Space Telescope? Um, all right, really? Okay, yes, the Hubble Space Telescope, the size of a school bus, um, up there right now. It's been up for 26 years. Um, it was launched by astronauts on the space shuttle, um, so I use that telescope too. So that's the telescope that um, NASA and Europe built, and it's pretty amazing. Um, and so I'm also working on a telescope um, that called the James Webb Space Telescope, which is going to succeed Hubble. It's going to be the next big thing after Hubble. Um, so I can talk about um, what we do with those telescopes. And then I can take some questions and, and go for there. Um, first off, um, I can tell you that when we use telescopes like this, so, all right, um, let's see. This, there we go. Um, so, yeah, so, so we build these telescopes and we put them up in space. Um, the Hubble Space Telescope um, is not actually that far away. It's only about 300 miles away, right up but it can be you know, anywhere around the world. So um, if you want, you can look up on the web how to see Hubble overhead. It'll look like a bright star kind of slowly passing overhead. Um, so we use Hubble. Um, and what we can do with Hubble is look at, take pictures of the universe and try to understand what's going on. All right, can I do a share screen? I know I, um, let's see. Yep, it's going to be a little green. I can There we go. And I can do application window there. So perfect. Yeah, yeah. So this is the kind of so I want to show you some of the things that we look at with Hubble. Uh, this is the uh, a galaxy cluster um, discovered by George Abel. So it's name is Abel 1689. And this is like one of the biggest cities in the whole universe. This is a place where there are thousands of galaxies all jammed together in the sky. 
um, in a space that if it were our part of the, of, the, of the universe would be like two big galaxies and a dozen little tiny galaxies. Um, but here, this is a galaxy cluster and there are thousands of galaxies all crammed in together. So I study these kinds of, so this is a really cool place for a bunch of reasons. One, there's a ton of galaxies. They collide into each other. They, um, they use up all their gas because they're colliding in and having interactions and, and forming a bunch of stars. Um, there's also tons of dark matter. Um, these galaxies are dominated by matter that we can't even see called dark matter. Uh, we don't know what it is. We don't understand it. We don't know where it came from. But we can see that these galaxies look a lot heavier than any of the mass that, that we can measure, all the, you know, the hydrogen and the helium. There's other stuff there that we can't figure out what it is. Um, and so these sorts of clusters, you can measure the dark matter, the hidden matter. Um, and if you look in these images, you can see that there are these little faint fuzzy things getting wrapped around. And those are galaxies that you're seeing from behind the cluster. The whole, cu the whole cluster acts like a telescope. All the dark matter and all the luminous matter in the cluster is bending the light uh, from background galaxies and letting us, uh, letting us, it's actually, it's just acts like a natural telescope and lets us try to understand what's going on um, behind. So I use those, I use these, these natural telescopes and then we use real telescopes um, or you know, artificial telescopes like the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, so let's see, how do I stop screen sharing? Um, all right, help. <laughs> uh, you should just be able to, there you go, you got it. We see you right. again. Back off, okay, yeah. cool. Um, yeah, so, so that's what we can do with telescopes like the Hubble Space Telescope. And we are now working to build a telescope that's about 100 times more powerful than Hubble. Um, and so that's called the James Webb Space Telescope. Let me pull up, I thought it was queued up, but let me pull up a picture of that. Um, so that's, there we go. Um, so if I share again, there we go. Um, so that's the so that's what the James Webb Space Telescope looks like. Um, this is what it would look like in space. It's not in space right now. It's in pieces on the ground, and we're building it and finishing it and putting it into space. Um, so this is a telescope that's built to do all the things that Hubble can't, or many of the things Hubble can't. It's going to be about a hundred times more powerful than Hubble. Um, if you look at it, it doesn't, it looks really weird, like it doesn't really look like a telescope. Um, like where's the tube if it's a telescope? Um, it doesn't have a tube because the tube weighs too much. It instead has these gold, um, these mirrors which have a thin film of gold on them to make them really reflective. Um, and it's got this cool groovy sun shield which is the, this whole telescope is about the size of a tennis court, right? Or a basketball court, it's really big. Um, and then the bottom and the pink is the spacecraft. That's where it has the computers and the rockets and the propulsion. So this is a telescope that is way bigger than any telescope we've launched in a space and is going to go past the distance of the moon. It's going to go out a million miles away from the Earth. And we're going to use it to look uh, at many different things. We're going to look at planets around other stars, which is really cool. We can, we can measure the atmospheres of planets around other stars and tell you what those, uh, what, what's in their atmospheres, right? Like how much water, how much carbon dioxide, um, what are these atmospheres made of? And then we can also look at galaxies um, all across time and try to get a sense of how galaxies evolved. And especially, we want to see the first galaxies that ever formed out of the Big Bang. Um, so that's pretty amazing, and it sounds like that's totally impossible, but we can do that, and I can explain how, if that's interesting, um, we're able, so these telescopes are so sensitive, and space is so big, that we can detect light that's been traveling through the universe for almost the whole history of the universe. So when we use a telescope like, like Hubble, or like the Webb telescope, we can see basically almost as far as it's possible to, to see all across the universe and to see galaxies as they looked 10, 12, 13 billion years ago. Um, so that's really neat. So that's one of the things that, um, that's one of the reasons we built this telescope. Um, so there's about a thousand people around the world that are building the Webb telescope and I'm one of them, I'm one of the scientists. So I do a lot of math and I figure out what it can do 
And especially, I do a lot of math figuring out, well, if we had to change something, because the engineers say that it's hard to build it this way, but can we build it this other way? What does that mean for what kind of measurements the scientists can make? Um, so it's a big team. We, have, we work with people all over the world, in Europe, in Canada, and in the United States to, to do that. Um, this telescope, the Webb telescope, is going to launch in 2019, in the spring. Um, and it's going to uh, send back like amazing, gorgeous pictures to Earth in the same way that the Hubble Space Telescope has. So that's the sort of like big picture. And here at Goddard, there's about 10,000 people here that work on this campus. And we're a mix of engineers and scientists and then like people who know money um, and can support the scientists and the engineers. So that's what we do here. So I'm going to stop and say that now's a good time to answer questions. So who was thinking awesome. about questions? Uh, so we'll go kind of round robin. So we can start with Ms. Krementizer's class. Okay, we have a question for you. Okay. How many pounds of metal has it taken to make that, that telescope so far? How many pounds of metal? Well, that's, a great, that's a great question. Okay, so I know how much the whole thing weighs when it's done. So the whole thing is about, is about 6,500 kilograms. So 6,500 kilograms. Right? So that's, mo let's see, now how much of that is metal is the hard part. <laughs> Um, a couple thousand kilograms of that is all the mirrors, um, which are made of a metal called beryllium. And then there's, uh, but a ton of the telescope is not made of metal, it's made of carbon fiber. So if you think about like really good carbon fiber, like that would, um, you know, like really good hockey sticks or um, anything that costs like expensive sports stuff is made of carbon fiber, or like really lightweight uh, airplanes the same thing. So all of the black, um, if I pull up the telescope again, um, all these black pieces here that, that hold this, the secondary mirror, those are all carbon fiber. And then behind the mirrors, this whole jungle gym of carbon fiber. Um, so that's a lot of the weight of the telescope. And in fact, because we're sending it into this really, to deep into space, it has to be really lightweight so we can, um, so we can get it out there so the rocket can lift it. So much of the weight of the telescope is actually really lightweight plastics and really lightweight carbon fiber. But there are a couple of thousand kilograms of mirrors as well, and those are made of the metal beryllium. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right, so now we'll go to uh, Ms. Michael's class, who has questions. Thank you so much. Okay, I have, I have two third graders who need to ask questions before they have to go back to their rooms, if I can <laughs> Thank you. Okay, come on up. Come up so that they can see your face. How you much go. fiber does it take? How much what? Fiber does it take? How much carbon fiber? Yeah. Um, that's a really good question. I can go ask the engineers and find out. It's a couple thousand. It's a couple thousand pounds of carbon fiber, um, and it's all in like really long. But I don't know, like, because when they when they usually make it, it's like in really long filaments, almost like yarn. And I don't know how long it all is if you stretched it out, but it's like a couple thousand pounds. Awesome. Thank you guys have another quick question? Yep, one more here. And then we can come back around later. Okay. What day is the new telescope going to launch? Ah, so we're hoping to launch it in the spring of next year, so that uh, spring of 2019. So not, um, not this spring, but next spring. Like which month? Um, we don't actually, so we're still trying to figure that out. It's going to be like sometime in the spring, like March through June. But we're still trying to figure out an exact launch day. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> sure. Awesome. So we can go to uh, Ms. Wolvenden's class. Do you have any questions oh. there? Great. Yes, we have uh, quite a few questions, but we start with one. How was the universe created, and how can we see that evidence that it... Okay, okay, so how did the universe get started? Um, so, um, about 100 years ago, Edwin Hubble, um, an astronomer who was using telescopes in, LA, in Los Angeles, noticed that all the galaxies looked like they were flying away from the Earth, right? So, and that the further the galaxies were away, the more, the faster they were moving. 
right? So it looked like everybody was trying to get away from us as fast as possible. So there's kind of two ways to explain that, right? One is that we smell really bad, and everybody, you know, <laughs> all the other galaxies are like, ah, pee you, and running away, right? And the, the furthest, you know, and the furthest away galaxies are the ones that have a chance to run fast, uh, the fast ones, right? So that's one idea, right? We stink and we're special. And so everybody's trying to get away from us. The other idea is that space is expanding, right? That the whole universe is, is, is expanding. And so if that's true, then that makes sense that the furthest away galaxies are moving the fastest because it's like, think about like a big loaf of bread dough, right? And like it gets inflated right it starts expanding and sp expanding and so the more s the the further away you are from another raisin if you're a raisin in the bread dough the further you are away from a raisin in in the bread dough the, the faster you're going to see that raisin moving so 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 edwin hubble published this and this was a really big deal and a big discovery and that's why he gets a space telescope named after him and everybody was like yeah it's probably not the stinky hypothesis it's probably not that we smell bad it's probably that space is expanding and in fact, this is something that Albert Einstein predicted, but he thought it was crazy talk. So he put in his paper, eh, it's probably not happening. So yeah, he actually had to do a bunch of stuff to make it go away, but the universe should be expanding. Um, so, okay, so that doesn't tell you how the universe began, but it tells you what's going on right now. And what's going on right now is that all of space is expanding. And so either it could be expanding forever, or you can say, well, you know what? Maybe a long time ago there was an initial explosion. There was a big bang that started this whole expansion. And it turns out, so that's why, so, okay, um, that makes a lot of predictions about how the sky should look at night. Um, and so it turns out that those, that's what you see in the sky. So when we look out in the space with radio telescopes, we can see this, this light anywhere you look on the sky that's really smooth and really uniform, and that's the cooling, like the cooling down light of that big explosion. So we call that explosion the Big Bang, um, which was, and, and you know, the, it, it's an idea that explains why the universe, you know, why all the galaxies are rushing away from us. And it also explains this, uh, this light, this afterglow, um, anywhere we look in the sky. So we think that that's, that's how the universe was created. It was in a big bang, um, which means that the universe has an age. It's 13.7 billion years old. It had a start. And it's expanding, and it's going to expand forever because there's not enough matter, there's not enough stuff in the universe to slow down the expansion and get it to come back in. Awesome. So we'll jump to Miss Katie's uh, class. Hello. Okay. How are the colors of the galaxy made? Um, how are the colors of the galaxies made? Yeah. You mean in real life or how we see them? Um, both. Okay. Um, let me pull let me pull that up. So let's see. If we go back, um, give me one second, I'm gonna pull up a better picture. Um, there we go. Um, you in it. There we go. Um, let me pull this up. So, uh, over here. So, okay, can y'all see that? Yeah. So it's like a gallery of a bunch of galaxies, okay? These are all galaxies that are interacting, that are, are slamming into each other and having like these violent collisions and it's like a total mess. Um, in these pictures, so these, um, these are images, I'll take them with the Hubble Space Telescope by a really nice guy I know called Aaron, Aaron Evans at the University of Virginia. And so these galaxies, so how do, first of all, how does Hubble see in color? Um, Hubble has, uh, Hubble's cameras only see one color of light at a time. And in fact, the way Hubble, so Hubble, like your digital camera, doesn't work that way, right, right? You take a picture and it takes all the colors at once. The way Hubble works is that it has like, they look a lot like colored, they act like colored filters, but they're more expensive than that. But um, imagine that you put like colored pieces of plastic in front of the camera. 
um, it works like that, right? It has these filters that only let in one color of light at a time. And so the way the Hubble telescope will do this is it'll take a blue, you know, it'll take like a, a blue picture, and then it'll take kind of a yellow orangey picture, and then it'll take a red picture. And then on the Earth, um, we get those pictures back separately, and then we combine those to make a three color image. So like, um, and um, you know, it's really you just kind of, I don't know, it's easy to make it ugly. Um, but the cool thing is that that tells you something about how these galaxies were made and how the stars were made. So in this image, you see how there's all the blue stars right here? There's like the really blue part of the image. Um, and then some of the stars look re really like yellow um, or even red. That's telling you about um, how old those stars are. So blue stars are really hot. They're more massive than the sun. They're way hotter than the sun. And they only live a couple million years before they die. Um, so blue stars, where you see blue, means that there are hot, young stars that have just formed in the last couple million years. Stars like our sun, which are old and older and yellow, can live for billions of years. And so where you see yellow or even kind of like yellowy red, that's where stars are that are going to live a really long time. And they're much less, they're mu not nearly so bright. But you make a lot of them. So when you look at pictures like this, you can see, oh, blue, that's where new stars are forming. Oh, yellow, that's where there's old stars like the sun. Awesome. So we can go back to Ms. Krementeiser's class. Another question? Um, how do stars die and what happens to them when they're gone? Oh, how do stars die? OK, cool. Um, and what happens to them? Yeah. And what? And what? And what happens when they're gone? When they're gone. Okay. Um, let me pull up a picture. Um, so, how do stars blow up? Um, so it really depends on how big. There we go. Um, so it really de depends how big the star is, right? So let me. You want to, you want the you want like the the sun first. We'll do the sun first, and then we'll do better stars, than the, more interesting stars than the sun. So the sun is a medium star. Sun is like super average in a lot of ways. It's, gonna, it's about 5 billion years old. The Earth is about 4.5 billion years old. So the Earth is almost as old as the sun, but not quite as old as the sun. The sun's about 5 billion years old, and it's about half out of gas, right? It's totally a gas, half full, half empty. So the sun can burn for about another 5 billion years, and then it's out of fuel. And by gas and fuel, I mean hydrogen, right? So the sun is supporting itself against collapse, right? Because there's gravity. Gravity is trying to suck it all down into a black hole. But it's supporting itself against collapse by, few, by um, smooshing hydrogen, you know, the simplest element, into helium. And when you do that, that's fusion, you get energy out. And that's you know, why we're alive. Um, because the sun is making, is, is doing that fusion, making light that sustains life on Earth. Um, so good job, sun. So the sun has enough power to keep doing that for about five billion more years. At the end of its life, it will run out of hydrogen, and it'll then start burning helium into carbon and oxygen, but that doesn't work very well. And so that is like, it's just not very efficient. You can't get a lot of energy out of that. And so the sun will try to burn helium, it'll finish with that, and then it isn't big enough to burn anything heavier. Um, and so the sun, at this point, will swell up to be a red giant. Um, and so, because as it starts burning helium, it's gonna, it gets really dense in the core, and then the outer part really expands. And so it's possible the Earth gets sucked up at this point, because the, the sun is going to get so big that its outer layers will run into the earth. And so in about five billion years. So you got about five billion years, right? So set your calendars. Um, so yeah, so, so in five billion years, it'll totally, so it will either come really close to the earth or it will, um, it will destroy the earth. But either way, it's going to be a terrible time to be on earth, right? Because the sun's going to get way more luminous. It's going to get way brighter. And it's gonna just it's gonna bake the Earth away. So the Earth's the Earth's atmosphere is gonna get vaporized. Um, it's gonna the the oceans will get boiled away. 
And even if you don't, you know, even if it doesn't um, eat the Earth, it's still going to, like, destroy life on Earth. Yeah. So we got five billion years to enjoy this planet, and then it's gone. Um, and that's the death, and then, and then, in case, even in case you did survive on the Earth, then the sun's going to turn into a white dwarf. Um, it's going to blow out its outer layers, um, and it's going to, um, let me pull up a picture of what that might look like. Um, so the sun will blow out its, ah, one second. Um, Okay, um, cool. So if you Google, as I have just done, Hubble and Planetary Nebula, um, you can see these are all pictures of stars that are done. They have finished their lifetimes. In the center is a little white dwarf. Um, and inside of them, there we go, that's the Ring Nebula. Um, all the stuff that you see, all the colors, is gas that used to be part of the star. But when the star died, it kind of bleh kind of, you know, belches it out into space. So this isn't an explosion. This isn't a supernova. This is just, bleh, I'm done being a star. And in the center <laughs> is this really hot white dwarf, which is super hot, way hotter than the sun. Um, and it can't collapse because it's kind of stable. It'll just stay there, and it'll cool until it's gone. Um, and then these gas clouds out here are really hot because they're getting lit up by the planetary, by the, by the white dwarf, but they're going to cool. So you can see these sorts of things with a small telescope. They're everywhere because this is what the sun and stars like the sun do when they die. Okay? But what's way cooler is stars that explode and blow up. Um, and the sun can't do that because it doesn't, it's not big enough. Um, but much bigger stars that are like 20, 30, 40 times the mass of the sun, so really big stars, those stars can blow up. And here you can see a picture. This is um, this this is a supernova. So when they blow up, they're called a supernova. Uh, and there was a supernova called 1987A because it blew up in 1987. It was the first one to do it. We're really good with names, astronomers. Um, and so this is a star that was about 20 or 30 times as massive as the sun, and it blew up. Um, and when a star, and now you can see this ring of debris around it. Um, but when it, and you can even see how that debris ring has been changing with time. Um, the supernova has aged and it's gotten brighter as this, this, um, this hot debris is like lit it up. Um, there's been a collision of the stuff from the star hitting uh, debris that was out in space already. So a supernova is crazy bright. It can be brighter than a whole galaxy um, and it lasts a couple months and it happens when a really big star explodes um, and then what's left behind is a black hole uh, or a neutron star. And that's a really like violent thing, and it totally can't happen to the Earth. The Earth doesn't, or it can't happen to the Sun, because the Sun just is not nearly big enough to explode like that. So really big stars, they're blue, they're hot, they live fast, they die young, and they explode. Stars like our Sun last 10 billion years, and then when they're done, they're kind of big and fat and swollen, and they just kind of give up. And the gas goes out into space, there's a white dwarf in the center, and you're all done. So. Awesome. Well, the whole life of a star. Uh, let's move to Miss Michael's class. Do you have another question you'd like to ask? Oh, we've got lots, but we'll give you one first. Okay. Come on up. <laughs> Hello. Um, how strong can the Hubble detect in space? Oh, like how faint, like what can it see? Yeah, like how strong can it like detect other things and what can it really see? Sure, let's see. Um, so that depends how long you look. Um, and so, but let's see. Um, let's, that's a good question. How do I think about how to s explain that? Um, boy, that's a good question. Because that's actually a question that astronomers worry about a lot, because when we have a good idea, we're like, oh, I want to see a supernova um, in a galaxy really far away. So the next question is, well, how far away can I see it with this telescope? So astronomers spend a lot of time with whiteboards, and markers, doing some math, trying to figure out, okay, I know how bright something is, and I know how far away it is. 
So how bright will I see it? And then figuring out, okay, with a telescope, how powerful is that telescope and how long would I have to look? Um, and so what for typical, like to see a galaxy, um, to see a galaxy that's maybe a couple billion light years away, we might need to look for me with Hubble for maybe three or four hours, right? For a galaxy that's maybe 13 billion years, light years away, like that's really about as far as you can possibly see, then Hubble would need to look for weeks. And there have been some programs with Hubble where we look for like, yeah, for like a couple weeks at only one thing or one little part of the sky. Um, and so Hubble, you know, let's see. Um, we can certainly see most of the stars in our own galaxy unless they're hidden by dust. Um, and then we can see big galaxies with Hubble, well, uh, really far away until they're about 13 million light years away. That's pretty Thank far, you. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so we'll move on to um, Miss Wolfenden's class. Um, how are you going to launch the new telescope? Oh, great question. Okay, how do we launch the new telescope? So the Webb telescope is, I said it was an international thing, right? It's America, um, the European Space Agency in Canada, and Europe is paying for the launch vehicle. So Europe, um, Europe bought the launcher, and it's a really cool rocket. Um, it's an Ariane 5. Um, so let me pull up a picture of what that looks like. Um, there we go. Um, so that looks like that. Um, so it's an Ariane 5 rocket. It has these two big boosters on the side and then one big booster in the middle, um, or one big rocket in the middle, and the telescope is in the middle up there uh, under the shroud. So that's where we're going to launch it. We're going to launch it from French Guiana, which is right on the equator in South America. Um, and so it's not going to launch from the Kennedy Space Center. It's not going to launch from Florida, which is bad because it means you can't beg your parents to go see it launch. It's going to launch from um, it's going to launch from the jungle in in South America. So it's it's going to be a lot harder to go see, but it's going to be on NASA television. Okay. What? So the rocket must be big. <laughs> it's really large. It's one of the biggest rockets that, that's currently being made. And does it all go in one piece, or do you have to like assemble yeah, it? Yeah, so it all goes in one piece. It's not, um, it, it's not like built in space by astronauts or something. It goes in one, it goes in one shot, um, and then it's out uh, really quickly past the distance of the moon in only a couple days. Awesome. All right. So now we'll go to Miss Huey's class, which unfortunately will be our last question because we are at our f coming to our 40 minute mark here. Uh, so Miss Huey's class. Um, do you think there are other forms of life outside our solar system? Do I think there's other forms of life outside our solar system? What do you guys think? Possible. <laughs> Possible. All right. Show, show of hands. How many people think there might be life on other planets? Other so, so, okay, so we don't actually know the answer, right? Like, we don't know. We've never found it. Um, that is a question that NASA is going to be working really hard for the next couple decades to try to answer. Um, we know now that there are as many planets in, the, in our galaxy as there are stars, pretty much. So when you look up at the stars at night, um, just think about there's about one planet, like one Earth-sized planet for every star that you see on average, right? So we, we know that our galaxy has hundreds of billions of stars, and we now know that means that there's hundreds of billions of planets. Now, some planets are probably too hot, some are too cold, some get zapped by radiation, right? And, um, but some are probably okay for life. And so the big question, which nobody on Earth knows the answer to, is how many of the planets that are nice have life on them, right? How hard is it for life to, to evolve? 
and nobody knows the answer to that. Um, we at, at NASA, we've been pl we've been making some ideas, like you know, at the like pencil and paper level of how big a telescope would you need to try to answer that question. And the answer is something like something maybe five times bigger than Hubble, like a 10 or 12 meter across telescope. With a telescope that big, you could look at you could look at planets around other stars and take spectra to see if there's life on, to see if there's plants on them, right? To see if there's chlorophyll or or um, uh, oxygen or or um, ozone, um, and try to figure out if they're inhabited. Um, now that's not looking for people and aliens. That's looking for grass, right? For chlorophyll, or something like it. Um, but I think that's a question that is kind of nobody on Earth knows the answer to. But in your lifetimes, we might figure out the answer of whether or not there's life elsewhere in the universe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're a <laughs> Awesome. All right. So that brings us to the end of our hangout. That was really awesome. Thank you so much for joining us, Jane. Sure. Happy to be here. Yeah. Her, definitely think everyone learned a lot just about outer space, you know, everything <laughs> out right. there. Uh, so I can unmute everyone and everyone can yell a nice good, good, well, big goodbye. Sorry. So remember to share your photos with hashtag uh, Explore Space on Twitter and on Instagram or on Facebook. Uh, we hope to see everyone again. So thank you. All right. Cheers. <laughs>